Thank you for watching Concord United on YouTube. Don't forget to hit subscribe so you can stay up to date with our latest videos. If you'd like to learn more about our church, please visit our website at concordunited.org. We hope you will take advantage of our many opportunities to share Christ, serve others, and grow in faith. We like to be biblical with everything we do, not just uh, the occasional blues song, but if you uh, are interested in following along with our sermon series as we will launch into a new one starting next week, uh, actually it starts I think the week after that, but we have a new Bible reading series. I don't know if you know this, we've been doing this for... Uh, over a year, we've just been working our way through the Bible, uh, together as a congregation, reading every day, daily readings, and you can get this September reading plan at the information desk, or you can go online and, uh, and get it there, and get it downloaded as a PB PDF, and put it on your tablet, your phone, your computer, and, you can, and we can all be reading together, and all of these daily readings line up with what we're doing in here on Sundays as well, in this room and in the other room. So, it's a way that we can all be on the same page as we study the Word of God and find out what the God of the universe has to say about us and our lives and how we can live them in a maximum way for Him. So I hope that you'll take advantage of that. I have a question now as we continue and really wrap up our sermon series about worry today. And I want to ask you a question. What do you sound like? And what I mean by that is, have you ever heard what you sound like? Now, 30 years ago, a lot of people hadn't. Now, with cell phones and smartphones and, you know, uh, making videos and that sort of thing, most of us have heard what we sound like. But, it, but most people are surprised the first time they hear their voice. And typically, the response is, that doesn't sound like me. Well, the fact of the matter is, it sounds exactly like you, because when we talk, we don't hear what we sound like, and there are two really good reasons for that. We hear uh, everything we hear because sound waves travel through the air, and they enter our ears, and they bounce and make our eardrums vibrate, and that's transferred to these tiny little hairs on the inside of our ears that then transfer that to this liquid that's in our inner ear canals, and it vibrates, and it then sends transmissions to the brain, electrical impulses, and the brain goes, oh, oh, that's a guitar, that's a drums, or that's someone saying, I love you, or, or whatever the sound may be. But when we talk, we hear that reflected off of whatever surfaces are around, but mostly what we hear is our head. My Aunt Nellie, bless her heart, when somebody was just babbling on, she would say, oh, he's just talking to hear his head roar. Well, there's actually something to that, because when we talk, it vibrates bones in our skull, and that also is transmitted to the little puddles of fluid that are in our inner, inner air canals, and that vibrates, but it's, it's a different vibration from what comes from the outside. So your brain is getting what you're hearing reflected back when you speak, and your head roaring, it's hearing the vibrations in your head, which sound very different. And that's why when you hear yourself, you think you sound different. But in, in fact, what you're hearing is what you actually sound like. I remember years ago when our daughters were little, we had one of those old school video cameras, you know, <clears throat> sat down on your shoulder like that and you lugged it into every dance recital and every piano recital and little musical that they were in and you watched the whole world through a little one by one square about that big and taped everything, literally videotaped it. So we would, we would video at our house a lot, Christmas and other times, and my mom would be there. And my mom liked to talk, and my mom talked a lot. And my mom was very, uh, it, it, you could never miss it was my mom talking. And I'm saying this with love, believe me, all the love I can muster. I miss her every day. But she, she would be talking in the background as we were videoing our girls in these different circumstances. And then we were playing them back one day. And you could hear her talking in the background. And my mom says, who's that? <laughs> well, mom, that's, that's you. That's not me. That sounds like some dumb hillbilly. <laughs> well, mom, you are a hillbilly. We all are. You're not dumb. That's a fact. She was not. But she couldn't get over how she sounded. And she said, that doesn't sound like me. And I said, well, I know, mom, but that's actually how you sound. And I say all of that to say this. 
Sometimes we may be in the midst of a conversation with one of the many relationships in our lives and one of the persons in those relationships. And sometimes we can say things that the other person is thinking, I can't believe you just said that. And if we heard it back, we would say, oh, that doesn't sound like me. But the person that we're having the conversation with would go, yeah, yeah, it does. You sometimes say things like that. And that can be a problem. It's a problem when people do that to us. It's a problem when we do that to others. That's why I want to talk about relationships this morning as we finish this series, Why Worry? Today, why worry about relationships? And let me pause and say for just a second that this is not going to be a talk about romantic relationships specifically because, that, that every, you know, people check out when you start that because not, or not everybody or at this moment is involved in a romantic relationship. This is a broad conversation about all the relationships relationships in our lives. And you can apply, if you can find some truth in this, you can apply it to whatever is appropriate for your life. But in relationships, we have, we worry about relationships, don't we? I mean, let's face it, we worry, we worry if we haven't pleased someone. I'm not sure that I'm doing what this person needs for me to do. I'm saying what they need for me to say. And for some of us who are pleasers, we really need that. And we worry then because the relationship doesn't seem to be going the way we expected. Or sometimes we worry because people aren't responding to us the way we thought they would have or should have responded in a certain situation. And that causes worry. Good example. I just saw my little granddaughter, Nora, who's right up there uh, in the skybox with her her daddy and, and Lynn, my wife, grandma. And just the other day, Christy, her mommy, uh, said that they were at Target. And Nora's three. Oh, she could see her. She's just a, this sprite, this ray of sunshine. And she talks. She's kind of like my mom. She talks pretty much all the time, and which I love, and I hang on every word she says. But, but so, so they're in Kroger, and they're standing in the line, and, and she has on her sparkly shoes, and she has on these new shoes that are, you know, they light up when you walk, and lots of kids have them, and they're very sparkly even when they're not lit up. And so she was very proud of her shoes. So she's standing in line, you know, you know, making them do their thing. And there was this, and Christy was so precious when she was telling the story because she's, she's very careful about using this word now. There was this, this wonderful elderly man standing behind us. I'm like, easy now, easy. I'm not ready to go with elderly. Don't look at me that way. Don't, <laughs> I'm not ready to go with elderly yet. I'll go with older, but not elderly. She's, but there was this, this really nice elderly man standing behind us. And, and so Nora was doing all this, and she was looking at him, and she, she looked up at Christy, and she said, Mommy, can that man not talk? And Christy was like, shh, honey, I, you know, she, she's like at the top of her voice. And Christy's like, honey, I'm, I'm sure he can talk. It's okay. Well, why isn't he talking about my shoes? <laughs> it's a good question because we all talk about our shoes all the time. But she didn't get the response she was looking for. And that was problematic for her. She was worried about that. Why is this man not commenting on my extremely cool shoes? And, you know, it's not funny sometimes when it happens to us in conversations and we're saying and we're talking and, and, and we're not getting back what we thought we would get back. So that's something that we worry about. We also worry about whether we are even worthy to be in a relationship. And I was reading this week and that, that actually is a lot more common than you might think. And it comes from insecurities that many of us have from things that happened to us a long time ago. And somehow we think that we're not worthy of a relationship with a certain person, and it could be, and we're talking about school or work or, or, uh, or fa different family members, friends, whatever the relationship may be. And all of these things cause us to worry. But we shouldn't worry because relationships are what life is all about, and we need to find a way to make those comfortable and solid if we can. Because the message of the Bible from start to finish is that relationships matter most. Of all the things in life, they do. And you can go back to, to Genesis and read in the very beginning when God refers to God's self as we, as in the creative process. First time I've read that, it blew me away. We, God said, what do you mean we? Well, we worship a God. We believe Father, Son, Holy Spirit, one God, three expressions. God was like the ultimate beginning relationship in the universe. 
And so it starts there and it goes all the way through the Old Testament into the New Testament. Of course, you've got Jesus and his relationship with his mother and his father. And you've got the relationships of all the disciples and people in the early church. It's all about relationships. And the Bible is full of stories about people with conflicted relationships. But the Bible also speaks to how we can find peace in the midst of some of these conflicted relationships uh, if we're willing to see it from God's perspective. In 1 Peter chapter 5, it says this, Humble yourselves, therefore, under God's mighty hand, that he may lift you up in due time, cast all your anxiety on him, because he cares for you. And that, is, that covers every dimension of our life. And so if we're worried about relationships, and we all have relationship worries from time to time. God cares about that, and he wants us to give that back to him. And I think one of the ways we do that is to think about how he would have us act in the midst of relationships. So I'm going to read another, just one verse, and it's, it's at the end of Jesus' Sermon on the Mount. And in that Sermon on the Mount, which has the part, the Beatitudes, where it talks about blessed are the poor in spirit, blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, blessed are the peacemakers, and so on. And then he goes on to talk about all these different situations we find ourselves in life and how God would have us react to that. So this, is, this like comes at the very end of that section of the Bible. And it, and it comes down to one verse, and I'm going to read it. Matthew 7 Verse 12, so in everything, this is Jesus talking, do to others what you would have them do to you. For this sums up the law and the prophets. And don't let law and the prophets, you know, make you uh, confused. Because law and the prophets, that was Jesus' way of saying the Bible. What, because that's what, you know, you've got to remember, when Jesus was around, there was only the Old Testament. And so it was called, the Hebrew people thought of it as the law and the prophets, because there was both law and prophetic writings in it, and, and a few others. But that's what he means. So he's saying, this sums it all up. It's the whole, it's the whole shooting match right here. Do unto others as you would have them do to you. But it's really important to understand that that's not quid pro quo. That doesn't mean, well, well, uh, I'll do to these people in, in my life as they are doing to me. <laughs> yeah, I will. And if they start dumping on me, then I'm going to dump on them, okay? And that's not what Jesus is talking about. Remember, this comes at the end of this teaching where Jesus talked about how people live righteously in the world. And what did he say? It's all about relationships. Don't commit murder. Don't commit adultery. Yet your, let your yes be a yes and your no be a no. Tell the truth. You don't have to swear on an oath. Just tell the truth. Give to the needy. All about relationship. We live in a vertical relationship with God, and that lives out then every day in horizontal relationships on the earth. And so Jesus is saying, I want you to put into these relationships that you're in. I want you to put into it what, what God would have you put into it. Come at it from a standpoint of righteousness. And don't hear righteousness as, I'm better than everybody else. No, no. It's, righteousness is just an attempt to live rightly, to live the way God would want us to live. And if we go into it with that, if we go into it like that, then we're not going to be so concerned about what we get back. And let me say this right now. Relationships thrive when we focus more on what we give than what we take. And so many times in relationships, people are interested in what they can get. I want to get my way. I want to do it this way. I want to get you to work for me. I want to get you to do things uh, so that I don't have to or to do things this certain way. I need, a, I need you to act a certain way. And that's not what we're talking about. We're talking about putting into relationships and focusing on what we put in because we can control that. We don't have any control over how someone is going to respond to us. Oh, I mean, you know, we can poke the bear and push their buttons and we can get a response. That's not what we're talking about. We can control what we put in. So what are you, what are you putting in to relationships let me put it this way to go back to our metaphor of hearing yourself. What do you sound like? What do you sound like? And I'm focusing on us right now. And I know. And by the way, let me pause again. 
Let me pause again. I understand that there are people in this room right now that have been in or may be in a relationship that could be borderline abusive. And it could be that somebody is is being overly passive aggressive with you and they're trying to manipulate you. It could be that someone has been verbally abusive. God help, I hope not physically, but it happens. And that's not what I'm talking about. If if we're in situations like that, then we need to do something about it quickly because nobody deserves to be treated that way. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about relationships that are, that are fairly healthy, but just have these moments, and we, we can make them healthier, and we can find peace even in a conflicted relationship. So I just want to make sure you understand. I'm not suggesting that we find a way to stay in there and endure abuse. Nuh-uh. That's not what I'm talking about. We're never, we don't deserve that. No one does. So, so, but But what are we putting into the relationship? How do we sound to other people? Because we can control that. And so if you think about when you record a voice, there are two or three dynamics involved. There's volume. How loud is it? And you know, if there's one thing that network news programs have taught us, particularly the the cable news channels, and there are several of them on both sides of a political perspective, you know what? What they've trained us is the one that yells the loudest is the one that gets the last word. And so, you know, I don't watch anymore because I just can't. To have these two people, you know, their little talking heads in these little squares on my screen, and they're both shouting at the top of their lungs, and you can't make out what one's saying. And, and, and it's like, this is not a conversation. This is not how we do relationships. We don't yell because it does just what it does to you and what it did to me. It shuts us down. I, I'm, not, I'm not listening to that. And that's what happens when we get the volume too loud in a relationship. Um, In James, and I love the little book of James over in the New Testament. It's only five chapters, and it's like a a handbook for Christian living. And in James chapter 1, verse 19 and 20, it says, My dear brothers and sisters, take note of this. Everyone should be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to speak to become angry because human anger does not produce the righteousness that God desires. It, we're not being godly. And, and understand righteousness is godly, just doing things God's way. We're not being godly if we are yelling into our relationships and simply trying to get our point across by trying to be louder than everybody else that we're talking to. You may have experienced this. I have the worst that ever happened to me uh, back in my radio days. I was on the air at a radio station here in Knoxville, and and I ha- we have to do disc jockeys have to do um, production. We we have to record commercials, and sometimes you have to do promotional announcements for some event that's coming up. And I had misread a date on a piece of copy, the the words that I was supposed to say. I misread the date on when it started, and I did not do this promotional announcement. It was supposed to freshen it up and make it sound day of instead of of old. And, And I just messed up. And so the old one played, and the program director, my boss, came into the control room while I was on the air yelling at me, cussing, not cursing. He was cussing. You know what I mean? He was cussing me. And I just, and so, so when he started that, I mean, I'm working, I'm trying, you know, the next thing you have to do is turn on the microphone and, and sound really friendly, you know, never mind that this madman is in here cussing at me, you know, so it's so counterproductive. So I just shut down. I shook my head. So when my air shift was over, I went into his office and I said, okay, two things. One, I was wrong. You're right. I, I did not freshen that promotion. And I'm sorry about that is on me. But number two, you cannot talk to me like that. My father did not talk to me like that. My father got angry with me. My father corrected me, but he never yelled at me and cussed me like a dog, and neither will you. So if that's going to continue, just I'm giving you my notice. He apologized to his credit, but it completely blew anything. Any, you know, I, I was, it, our relationship was never the same. I worked. I did my job. He didn't last too much longer, which happens sometimes with hotheads. But it blew everything. It just just shuts us down. You can't do that. And here's something I'd like to say about that. If you have to yell to make your point, you need a better point. Amen? You need a better point. If that's the only way you can get anything across. 
So, so we have to watch our volume level. And, and another thing that impacts when we record is distortion. Now, when you're laying down a little blues guitar, you like a little distortion, uh, maybe a lot, but but not in a conversation and not when you're trying to record voice. You want it to be pure and true. And when I say distortion in context of relationships, I'm talking about distorting the truth or distorting the, 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 the trajectory of conversation. There are lots of ways to do that. And sometimes you've been in conversations, and maybe you've done it and I've done it, where you start kind of improvising a little and playing fast and loose with the facts you know, to try to make your point or to try to <laughs> cover up something. I don't know. But we can do that. We start getting away from the truth. Or we start bringing things up that, aren't, up that aren't germane to the conversation anymore. I go over this with people in premarital counseling all the time. If you're talking about this and, and, and somebody makes a good point that you've made a mistake or they'd like for you to think about the next time you drop your socks next to the open clothes hamper instead of in it, which, by the way, is a valid complaint, you know, then your response is not, yeah, well, you burned the pizza last week. That's a distortion. That, that doesn't help anything. We're not getting at the truth of the matter. You have to get, we have to get to the truth of what's happening and have integrity in our relationships. Psalm 41, I love this. The psalmist is praying to God, and he's saying, I know that you are pleased with me, for my enemy does not triumph over me. Because of my integrity, you uphold me and set me in your presence forever. If we maintain our integrity in a conversation, the stuff that we put into relationships, if we maintain our integrity, stick with the truth, stick with the topic at hand, and try to see if we can, if it's conflict, to see if we can come to a resolution, God will honor that. God will, you know, the people that we're in relationship with hopefully aren't our enemies, but you get the idea of the psalmist. No one's going to triumph over you. They may, they may try to make you think they've won an argument by being disingenuous, but if we just stick to the truth and integrity, then we will have peace in it. That's on them. If somebody else wants to make stuff up, okay. But we'll have peace because we have done it with integrity. God will bless the truth even if it hurts. If it hurts us to have to, to, have to speak the truth in love or if we think it's going to hurt somebody else, you can tell the truth. And if, if you're telling the truth in a situation, calmly, rationally, lovingly, and someone gets upset, that's on them, not you. Distortion can be a problem in a relationship. We need to stick to the truth and be pure. And one more, tone. Whenever you record, what's the tone? Is it shrill and trebly? Is it muffled and you can't really hear it, really bassy, you know? You want the tone to be just right. And when I say tone, I'm not talking about vocal quality. I'm talking about the tone of what we're saying. My mother said to me a time or two, and maybe you've heard this before when you were a teenager, and I was a smart aleck, and I guarantee you I was a smart aleck, 16, 15, 16 year old, big time. And my mother on a couple of occasions that I remember said, don't take that tone with me, young man. You ever heard that? That's what I'm talking about. You can't say things like that. I'm your mother, and it's inappropriate, and it's going to harm our relationship. And it does, and it's awful when you say that and usually feel badly about it later. That means there is actually a heart beating in there, even though the hormones may be overcoming it at the moment. Tone. And I found this out. I learned this in our relationship. I'm saying ours with Lynn. Lynn's up there with, with Nora and Dale. Uh, I'm sorry. <laughs> That's my people. <laughs> That's not uh, she's my beloved. And one time, Lynn loves, maybe the technical word is knickknacks, little things, little, little craft objects that you get from vacation or wherever. And, and she, gets, she loves those. And, and I'm so glad that she does because they remind me of places we've been. She doesn't only buy them, she makes them. And a lot of times we go to the beach, and I think she's done this for a lot of our beach trips. She'll find some appropriate little container, and she'll bring a little bit of that beach, sand back from that beach, and maybe a shell or two. And it's and it, it reminders. Oh gosh, I remember that trip. 
I have one on my desk right now, one of the best beach trips that we ever took. And I have one of these little things that she made that sits on my desk. And when I'm feeling overwhelmed, I look at that and I can hear the waves and I can see her sitting next to me in a beach chair. It's wonderful. But there, we have a lot of them. Okay, we have a lot of them in our house. Not as many as we used to have. I, I know. So we've moved, but we do. Anyway, so my, I guess my brother and his wife were over at our house for dinner. And this has been, it's been three or four years ago. But I'll never forget it, and here's why. And I hate to tell this story, but I'm going to tell it. Um, they came in, and they were talking about some of, these, some of these things that she had made and some of these crafts, and they're talking about them. And so Mr. Sensitive here, Mr. Sensitive says, yeah, yeah, I know. It doesn't matter what the weather is outside. There's always a small craft warning in our house. I thought that was funny. You didn't think that was funny? My, my brother and his wife did, small craft warning. It's a weather term. Anyway, Lynn didn't think it was funny either. And I, when I looked at her, she looked at me, and I thought she would be mad. She wasn't mad. She was hurt. It hurt her deeply because those little small crafts that she makes or buys are important to her. They mean something to her. They mean something to me too. I was just trying to be sarcastic and get a laugh. And my tone was absolutely, positively out of line, wrong. And I hurt my beloved, this woman that I love with every fiber of my being. I hurt her. And we do that sometimes when we take the, a wrong tone and we say things. And it's not just the way we say them, it's the words we say. And we think it's funny. We're going to be sarcastic and try to make someone we love the butt of a joke. It's not cool. It wasn't cool with her, and I felt terrible about that. And I still do. I've made it up, hopefully. But you know what? You can't just immediately make it better by saying, I'm sorry. You know, the wound's already there. And, and, it, was a, and it was, you know, I mean, she never, she's like, I'm walking out the door. That doesn't come up in our relationship. But it, but it, it certainly created a distance for a while, mostly because of me. Because I was ashamed to talk to her. I knew I'd hurt her. And here's, here's the bottom line for all of this, why we are careful with our tone, why we're careful not to distort whenever we talk, why we're careful not to just try to overcome somebody with sheer volume. Here's why. Because relationships provide the best opportunity to reveal our relationship with Jesus. Wouldn't it be wonderful if in all of our relationships, wouldn't it be great if people observed us in relationship and they would think, you know, they must be a follower of Jesus without us ever saying a word to them about it. Wouldn't it be great if they just got that from us, from what we're putting in? to a relationship, from what we're putting into it. We're putting Jesus into the relationship. If somebody that didn't know us saw that and said, you know what, they must be a Christ follower because of the way they're interacting. Wouldn't that be fantastic? And it can be. It can be. It's up to us. And this will not fix, these things won't fix every relationship issue we have. But they can bring us peace. You know, if, if you think you can't please everyone and, and you're a pleaser and you have this need to please everyone you're in a relationship with, here's a headline. <laughs> and you already know what it is. You can't. It's impossible. So why don't we try to please Jesus in our relationship? Why don't we just try to please him? And, and, if, and if we feel like we've let somebody down because we didn't respond the way they expected us to, okay. If we make a point and it's true and somebody gets all bent out of shape about it, okay, that's on them. If we've told the truth and love and we haven't distorted the situation, that's on them, not us. And we can find, and I know that sometimes it can cause ripples in a relationship, but at the end of the day, we can find peace in that knowing that we had integrity and we spoke the truth in love. 
And please, in any relationship, if you ever think you're not worthy, I've said this many occasions, and so here's one more time. If you think you're not worthy in any relationship, look at the cross. Imagine the cross in your mind. Imagine that the Lord of the universe, the almighty God of all creation, came to this earth in flesh and blood as a little baby and lived for 30-something years modeling what kingdom living looked like, healing the sick, raising the dead, feeding the hungry, doing all of this stuff only to be tortured and killed for all of his work. He chose to do that. He did that on purpose because he had you in mind. Because he loves you and thinks you, he thinks you, 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 you. He thinks you were worth it. And I think that's more important than what somebody else thinks about. I want people to, to think I'm worthy. And I'm probably not worthy all. I wasn't worthy of Lynn in that moment when I said such a careless thing. But I am. Because Jesus says I am. And he says you are. And if we bring him into that, that's why we sang that song. You've got a friend. I've got a friend. We've got a friend. And he will take our tears and our scars and he will take all of our trouble and all of this stuff. And he will turn it into beauty and he will remind us every day that he loves us and that we are worthy because he's chosen us. And then that's what we put in to the relationship. I think that's what he means when he says treat others the way you want to be treated. Bring Jesus into the relationship and you'll find peace. I promise you. You'll find peace in the midst of it all. Let us pray. Almighty God, we thank you for loving us that much. We thank you for wanting to be in relationship with us, even us, knowing where we've been and what we've done. And you want more than anything in the world a relationship with us. We thank you for that. And we pray, oh God, that you would help us to rely on that in our relationships, that we can offer that kind of love, that kind of integrity, that we might find peace in the relationships of our lives. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.